welcome all. We've got some uh, some power issues in some of our locations, so um, thank you for for your patience. Uh, I wanted to welcome uh, David Hinton tonight. This is the second time we've had David on this uh, Pacific Zen Luminaries series. And David out is, as you know, out with a new book. It's called Wild Mind, Wild Earth. And uh, he has honored us with one of his uh, early meetings uh, in the book tour that he's doing virtually and whatever around, around the country. And very excited about this book because it's about one of the most important issues we're facing today, which is the existence of the human species and how, how we, if we can, how we can save the earth and how we can maintain this, both this wild earth and this wild mind. And we'll go through and we'll do a few readings and uh, we'll do a little bit of poetry and have some Q and A through it. But first, uh, to let people come on, let's just uh, let's just sit just for a minute, if we would. David writes, we love this world, this living planet. We feel joy when life thrives and grief when it suffers and dies. This may seem obvious and uninteresting in and of itself, but it's a mystery, isn't it? It's a mystery, isn't it? a mystery, isn't it? Well, David Hinton, welcome to, to our series again. Uh, very excited to, to talk to you tonight, not only about your, your new book, but also about some of the things we didn't touch on so much, uh, like uh, the Mountains and River School, the ancient, ancient uh, roots of Chan and of uh, Taoism. And so I'd like to hear what you might have to say about that. But I, I thought maybe we could just jump into the deep end of the pool to begin with and perhaps ask you to do a reading um, on page eight, uh, much more. Okay. And finish, uh, um, finish up the poem uh, at the end. All right. Uh, the, the book is divided in two parts, the first the first part, the first half is called uh, How a Little Poem from Ancient China Could Save the Planet. So that's the poem that will, that I'll, I'm going to, I'll read these paragraphs and the, the end of them comes this poem. And that's meant to be in part serious and in part facetious, that idea that this poem could save the planet. Yes, we are much more than we think we are. And that is liberation of astounding proportions. Even simple perception, a gaze into star-strewn night skies, for instance, or stream water braiding liquid light between stones. In sight, 
we find that utter belonging quite literally and scientifically true. The cosmos evolved countless suns and planets. And here on our planet Earth, it evolved life forms with image forming eyes like ours. So what else is that gaze but the very cosmos looking out at itself? What is thinking but the cosmos contemplating itself? And our inexplicable love for this world, our delight and grief, what is that but the cosmos loving itself, delighting in itself, grieving for itself? We are wild through and through, wild mind, wild earth, wild cosmos. This is how Paleolithic and ancient Chinese people understood it. And it seems clear enough, even self-evident, once we step outside the cultural assumptions we have inherited. This is our most magisterial identity, an identity that encompasses all of existence, the 10,000 things of earth and cosmos looking out through our eyes. In their expansive and ravishing dimensions, we find our kinship with those things, our love and emotional entanglement. And we also find an ethics for what happens to earth quite literally happens to us. Who knew ethics could be so beautiful, this valuing of the 10,000 things, each in its own exquisite and individual clarity. Here it is that ethics distilled into a simple seeming little poem of crystalline scene that was written by Dumu in ninth century China. Egrets, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade, they fish in shadowy streams. Then startling away into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a tree full, tumble in the evening wind. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love the lines that, uh, so what else is the gaze but the very cosmos looking out at itself? <laughs> Could you speak to perhaps this, this paragraph and, and yeah. why you chose this poem? Uh, the poem just because it's, it's, uh, it's an aspect especially beautiful image, uh, imagistic poem, but it's not, it's not, it's pretty typical of Chinese poetry. So it's meant to be a typical example, just an especially crystalline and distilled example. Um, and the seeing that, I, we talk about um, in Zen, we talk about empty mind, and mirror mind, all within the kind of Zen or Chan framework. But, but what I was describing in that paragraph is the same idea more in our contemporary scientific language. Um, and that is, we, we talk about, well, we all have Buddha nature, which is we all have empty mind, and, and we're, we have it from the beginning, whether we're enlightened or not in the sense that yet yeah, we're, we're all always already enlightened because we have that Buddha mind or that empty mind, that mirror mind. But then if you think about, and if you think about for in, in ancient China, that doesn't mean some, that doesn't mean some kind of abstract transcendental mind. What that, for them, for Chan people, um, this is all about, Empty mind is all about reintegrating at a real at the deepest level with the cosmos, with you know what they call it Tao. We would call it the cosmos natural process, or I use the word existence tissue. Mm -hmm. um, that is the cosmos seen, seen as this living, um, self-generative um, organism. So I tried to. I tried to say that in a contemporary scientific way. And in that way, we are always already enlightened because quite literally um, the cosmos 
is constantly in evolution and development. And what it 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 evolved sons magically, and actually in the third generation of sons. So sons, like everything else in the uh, in Tao, which is all you know, Lao Tzu talked about Tao as um, all transformation, transformation and change as the um, the most basic nature of things. Like the, the oldest philosophical book in China is the I Ching, the Book of Change. So. The cosmos is in, in its constant transformation, has evolved three generations of stars. Stars have come into, come, have emerged, come into being, evolved through their lives and died. And in the third generation of stars comes our sun and our planet. The planet evolves life forms, the life forms evolve image forming eyes. So quite literally, when we look out at the egrets taking off into the mountains or into you know the tree in your front yard or whatever you're looking at, you are the cosmos looking at itself. Mm. And we tend in 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 Chan and uh, to say, well, what we need to do or um, is empty our minds, um, get rid of thinking, um, so that you would think, okay, well, seeing is the cosmos seeing, but the next step is, Thinking too is, and and for the for Chan people who were essentially Taoist rather than Buddhist, they thought the thought process to to try to, to the idea of meditation as a as a kind of tamping down and um, snuffing out thoughts is sort of wrong headed. That that's that's like fighting against Tao, which is exactly what you don't want to do. So the contemporary scientific version of that is. We are also the cosmos thinking itself. You know, we, every time you think about um, the sixth extinction coming, you're the cosmos thinking about itself. And every and every time we feel the sixth extinction happening, feel grief for it. That's the cosmos feeling itself, which is kind of um, someone pointed this out to me the other day or reminded me that it's kind of counterintuitive because the cosmos is completely indifferent, right? doesn't care about us um and yet in us it feels itself and it um loves itself and it thinks about itself and it looks at itself so somehow it's kind of magic it can be utterly indifferent and you know passionately loving and grieving yeah yeah that's lovely that's lovely um <clears throat> you know when we were talking before uh, I, I i really appreciate your your feel for Chan, you know, which uh, certainly not in all all literature. Uh, and I was wondering about, you know, if you had gotten any formal training or if you were sitting with a group or doing koan work or whatever, and you said, uh, it's just me and the ancients. Hmm. Do you, what, one thing we didn't really learn about you last time, tell us about how you came to be a translator and how um how you became attracted to living a life of living with the ancients working with mm -hmm. the ancients okay uh well i started as a poet well or, or as a philosopher i mean first i was doing philosophy and i was reading Lao Tzu and some zen texts um but then but then it was poetry and and there and um, ancient Chinese poetry is very much part of modern American poetry, like Gary Snyder and Kenneth Rexroth, from who were California based, like you, you most of you. Um, uh, and then at some point, I um, I read it's is I read that um, Du Fu was the greatest poet in human history and. Within one week, for just oddly, three or four times in different places, he's the greatest poet in human history. He's the greatest poet in Chinese history, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought I would find out about it. And I was living in New York. So I went to the public library, which has one of the biggest Asian collections in the country, and read everything I could on Dufu. And I wasn't convinced. But then one day I f there, I found a book called The Little Primer of Dufu, which some of you might know, which has 36 Dufu poems in every stage of 
their of translation or of their existence. That is, the original characters, word for word, tran, tran, um, the word for word translations of the lines, um, line by line translation, poet, a, a poetry, poetic translation, and then a prose translation. So I could see all the way into Chinese language and poetry and the whole translation process as if I could read. And I sort of spontaneously started translating hmm. and realized how, from just from the point of view of poetry as a poet, how just the whole world that wasn't in English translations that no one, no one was seeing or no one was translating. So I started, you know, hanging out there from morning until night working on this stuff. And then I, so then I went back to graduate school, learned Chinese. So I came to it as a poet and then I was just wanted to make this literature more in the mode of Snyder and Rex Roth and Pound as this really, this literature that has this ma these magical depths and this imagistic clarity. Um, also because I, from the beginning, like Snyder was interested in this conjunction, learning from Snyder, this in conjunction of Asian culture, Zen, um, Chinese culture, poet, Chinese poetry, primal culture, ecology. So I was putting all those together in, a, in my way. But slowly, and slowly as I was translating, you know, sort of book after book, um, I'm not that smart, so it took me a long time to see this. I started becoming more and more aware of the really rich philosophical framework underneath it. Um, and, and then slowly my interest sort of shifted there. So I've been, that's why I've been doing, I did, I've done a bunch of philosophy books, the, uh, the, the seminal masterworks like um, Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi and Yi Jing. And now I'm doing Zen uh, Chan text. Um, and I mean, and the, so, so, sort of to come back to your part of your question was um, my training or practice in, in Zen is, has been inhabiting the minds of all of these poets and philosophers who, you know, the people who sort of invented it. Because Chan really is the framework within which Chinese culture works, paintings, calligraphy, and poetry. So I inhabit the mind of a poet for a year while I translate him. They've all been hymns because the women were all, that's, you know, the, the usual, the usual monstrous story. Um, I inhabit that mind and that mind is kind of made out of Chan. Um, so it's like one, one mind after another, um, you know, a dozen, two, three dozen poets and and um, and now I have a book coming out that's the, a kind of anthology of Chan texts from the very beginning, actually from the Yi Jing on. So I've inhabited all those minds. And I don't know, you learn something from it. Yeah, it seems like you've migrated towards Chan though in your translation, your focus um, with China Root. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I feel like um, Hunger Mountain really had a, a Chan feeling in it without being explicit. And yeah. now you're getting more and more explicit with the gateless barrier and and the like. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's it's kind of interesting that it was in Ma uh, Hunger Mountain, which for people who don't know is the book about walking up a mountain here in Vermont uh, one autumn uh, over and over and over and kind of digging into the the weave of consciousness and mind. So that had a lot of Chan in it, a lot of Chinese um, Taoist Chan. Chinese poets and things like that. And somewhere for some reason, I got interested in the, what, what you call the Mu Koan, uh, the first koan in the Nogate Gateway. And so I wrote, I think part of one chapter in Hunger Mountain is about that. And, and then that just kind of sat there for a book or two. And then, and then I, then I thought, oh no, there's a lot more there. Often one of my books, my books grow out of unfinished material in a preceding book. Hmm. That was the thing in Hunger Mountain. So then I thought, oh no, I need to really go after this and, and where this, the Mu thing, which is in Chinese absence or um, uh, Ooh, uh, really happens as no gate gateway. 
Um, so I translated that. And then I thought, well, maybe let's get more direct. And then so I wrote China Root, which goes straight at all the that whole Chan worldview and um, at the deepest level. Um, yeah, and I'll do I'll do some more. Hopefully, I'll get back to poetry if I live long enough. <laughs> well, we look forward to it. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you uh, about um, Bodhidharma. We talked about it, and and uh -huh. you you had said that there. Are probably many bodhidharmas and that uh, much of the Chan ethos or uh, insight really came from, from Lao Tzu and, and uh, from Taoism in the mountains and river school, which predated bodhidharma. What, um, yeah. can you tell us something about that? About yeah. what was the world of Chan before Chan? Okay. Um, yeah, that's one of the most, for me, the most exciting things about this anthology that's coming out next year is tracking, tracking these ideas. And um, from the I Ching and the Tao Te Ching and watch them. So you, the, the sort of the Taoist framework starts in the, really the Tao Te Ching. And then uh, early around in the two, three hundreds after Buddhism got here, there was a big school of philosophy that um, that thought through um, the Taoist philosophy and, and really emphasized this cosmology and ontology, and that's called the Dark Enigma Learning School. Um, so that established a kind of conceptual framework that all the artists and intellectuals took for granted. And then like a hundred years later, two Buddhist sort of monk scholars who were also just Chinese artists intellectuals, because Chan is not like this separate world from Chinese culture. It's completely embedded in it. Um, all the artists intellectuals knew it, visited monasteries. Um, it, it was the framework within which paintings and poetry worked, like I said. So anyway, those people took dark enigma learning and sort of blurred it and sort of used Buddhism to develop it some further. And uh, the, the, one of the most, one of the all time great Chinese poets is Xia Lin Yuan, who I translated a book of. Turns out he wrote a, an essay, which is the first identifiable Chan essay because it talks about instantaneous enlightenment and a lot of the really basic Chan principles that we think of as coming later with Bodhidharma or the Sixth Patriarch. He's, they're all in this Cialinio essay, and this is about 400. So it's this is like 150 years before Bodhidharma, you know, the, the reputed Bodhidharma. So, but the interesting thing is, if you look at Bodhidharma's texts, especially the one that's the most, people say is the most authentic of the Bodhidharma texts, so here's a person that supposedly came from India and brought Buddhism, Chan, or Zen Chan from India. Uh, but if you actually look at the book, uh, at the text, it's um, it's all it's all Taoist. It's all it, the the two primary ideas in that text come straight out of the Sialinguan essay. So whoever wrote that Bodhidharma essay had read the Sialinguan essay and been hugely shaped by it. And that's just one. And throughout the Bodhidharma texts, they're just they're just loaded with Taoist um, assumptions and Taoist concepts. So I, you know, I, I say in China Root, you know, that uh, Chan, and this isn't really, you know, just me, I'm not the only person who says this. Uh, Chan is really anti-Buddhist, and you can see it all over. Even Xiling Yu on that, um, poet who wrote that seminal essay explicitly goes to lengths to say to distance himself and this new this he calls it like this new Buddhism this new now he didn't say new Buddhism but he says um, a new way of seeing distancing it from Indian Buddhism um, yeah and that it's the assumption that Chan is a kind of reformulation of Indian Buddhism, because I, I, I think you all know Indian, Indian Buddhism came into China like first century, and, and then the standard line is it sort of evolved 
uh, in China and, and the Chan is essentially Indian Buddhism reshaped a little bit by Chinese. But I, I think the, the fact of the matter is Buddhism came in, it added a little bit, it kind of crystallized some things in the, that whole Taoist dark enigma learning framework. And that became Chan. So Chan is more, is very little Indian Buddhist, so conventional Buddhist. It's almost all Taoist. They use some, they use Buddhist terminology for a couple of reasons sometimes, not actually as much as you think. They use it either institutionally to give themselves sort of the, the cachet of an ancient exotic foreign culture, or they use it as a way of attracting or speaking to conventionally Buddhist trained um, people as a way of, you know, talking to them in their own language. Um, and that idea that that Buddhism, that Chan is essentially just um, an extension of Buddhism is also what led to a lot of mistranslation when it, Americans started translating the old Chan texts because they misinterpreted a lot of things, assuming they invested every the text with a lot of sort of conventional Buddhist metaphysics that it wasn't that, that isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, in in your book, you go you make a deep dive into the argument that the pa paleo culture, the early paleo culture, was. Um, in many ways, very different from the culture of today. So it was gynocentric. Um, it was more in tune with the environment. It, it wasn't, um, you know, saw animals as, as being um, really brothers and sisters, uh, rather than later Lynn White's uh, essay mm -hmm. on the origins of our ecological disaster point out, and which you reference in the book. but. Let's uh, read something about um, that, if we might, that you sort of explain. On page 72, starting on the second paragraph, but as we begin to see. Yeah, okay. But as we have begun to see, the Paleolithic survived into ancient Chinese culture, where it was refashioned to form the Taoist Chan conceptual framework. Uh, this is Lynn White's Beatnik Zen. Now, oh, that's a kind of a reference. Um, Lynn White wrote this essay that John just mentioned. In the essay, says um, the essay says that the origins of our ecological crisis are Christianity. That is the idea that the Genesis, that the, the planet, the Earth was given to us by God to populate and exploit, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, and then at some point in the essay, which I read this when I was in college, and this little glitch in this essay has stuck with me ever since. And he says in it, this is written in 68, I think. 60, 67. Says, yeah, 67. I just read it last week. Yeah. Yeah. He says, the, our, he, he says, so how do we solve, you know, so he's talking about how do we solve this problem that's built so deeply into our culture? And he says, the real revolutionaries are the beatnik Zen people. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, but then he goes on and says, well, we can't really talk about that because they're so out there. That's not useful culturally. So he talks about St. Francis, the, you know, sort of the, the saint uh, who, who is uh, sort of the saint of... Um, the patron or, saint of ecologists. Of ecologists, yeah. Um, yeah. Who, yeah. Who preached to the birds. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, yeah. So that's what, that's what this is talking about. So we're refashioned to form the Taoist Chan conceptual framework. White's beatnik Zen, Chan was adopted from China by Japan, where it was known by the Japanese pronunciation of the Chan ideogram, Zen. And in fact, Taoist Chan sh shaped thought in a society structured very much like our own. Like us, ancient Chinese scholar officials were highly educated, empirically minded, and intensely textual. They worked in offices as government bureaucrats. They produced a complex body of cultural work, philosophy, poetry, painting, calligraphy. 
They inhabited large and internationally cosmopolitan cities and traveled widely between those cities and also deep into rural and wilderness areas. All of this within a highly diversified economy with the same basic elements as ours, money, markets, agriculture, artisans, merchants, transportation, etc. Thus, unlike the Paleolithic model, the Taoist Chan framework seems to offer a more directly applicable alternative to the Western paradigm, a way of opening ourselves to our original wild mind nature, its elemental kinship with wild earth and the ecocentric ethics implicit in that transformation. And indeed, it seems to be a fully formed articulation of the conceptual framework emerging from the conceptual transformation that has unfolded over the last few centuries in the West, and which was, like Taoism and like Taoism Chan, inspired from its beginnings by the philosophical insights of Paleolithic cultures. That last can you, point, can you, yeah, can you maybe talk to us about the Paleolithic culture and how it survived in Chinese culture to be of yeah. some use to us today, I think, is the argument. Yeah. This has been something that I've loved sort of discovering over the last, actually, a couple of decades. But, um, yeah, so ancient China, like uh, two or 3,000 BCE, was a... Um, uh, essentially, it was not essentially different from Christian, the Christian West in its in its base, deep philosophical structure. That is, it was a monotheism. It was uh, run by it was controlled by males and a male god, and um, government got its power through access to that god. You know, by through supposed access to that god, um, and that all crumbled. And when uh, when Lao Tzu and Confucius arose, that's when Chinese were trying to rebuild a kind of uh, conceptual framework for their culture. And I think they seem to instinctively want it to be empirically based because both of the, those systems are empirically based rather than religious and metaphysical. Chinese have zero patience for metaphysics. Um, and like the Tao Te Ching seems pretty clearly to be, um, it's very fragmentary. All of you have probably read it and know this. It's very fragmentary and mysterious. And it's pretty clear that it's built out of fragments from the, a, a kind of oral wisdom tradition that precedes it for, by probably thousands of years. And this is kind of not, a new, not unusual because the Book of Songs, the, which was about the same time the earliest book of poetry was also and we kind of know this historically, compiled from oral tradition poems that were collected and translated into classical Chinese and then assembled in, into a, a te, uh, an anthology of sort of people's poetry, but um, folk poetry. So, um, so that's so the Paleolithic somehow survived under the surface of this, you know, this big male dominated um, power structure and came and resurfaced you here in the Tao Te Ching, the Tao, which is what we would could think of as what, uh, the existence tissue cosmos, the dynamic living organic cosmos, uh, is referred to over and over as female, you know, explicitly the mother, the fe dark female enigma and things like that. So there, it, it's, it's got that old gynocentric worldview. Um, and then the, and then, and so that's what, and so that's what generated um, Chinese culture. All, you know, all all of culture, like I've said, the poets, the philosophers, the painters, the calligraphers, government officials. They all. This was the this was their, their what what you would call the sort of the spiritual structure of consciousness for them. And the really fascinating thing to me is that that transformation is exactly paralleled in the West. That is, we had this mono, monolithic monotheism for a couple thousand years. And then in the Enlightenment in the 15th and 16th and 17th century, that started to crumble. And an amazing 
fact about that is that um, a, a large part of that crumbling in Europe came from uh, Native American culture, believe it or not. There were travel um, books of sort of travel accounts of travels in Native America um, by Europeans. And also these books that were like discussions with Native American elders, like um, sort of debates with Native American elders, philosophical debates. And those were kind of like transcribed and published in Europe. And they were really quite popular and they were hugely influential on a whole range of intellectuals. And you know the most relevant for this discussion are the British Romantic poets, Wordsworth. And the one, the, the big thing that that led to was rather than the, Euro, the, the traditional European idea that we are spirits or souls that we're radically different from the world and the world is just this, this um, meaningless and valueless stuff for us to use, that idea, which Lynn White identifies as the root of our environment, environmental crisis, well, that idea was challenged by these all these accounts of native culture and then, we, and then you, and then the, the the amazing transformation which we take, we don't even notice now, is before this revolution, what the wild was considered horrible. Like I quote in uh, Wild Mind, William Bradford off the coast of New England when he was arriving here on the Mayflower, looking out and describing what he saw as this, just kind of this horrible, horrible world of wild beasts and wild men and this terrifying death and wilderness. He uses those words, will, I think wilderness and wild. Meanwhile, at almost the same time in Europe, this transformation is happening and with and you start seeing it with Wordsworth and Shelley, where suddenly they start realizing how sustaining, you know, quote unquote, nature is. That's where they wanted to be. That's, that's, that's that, that nature was beautiful. Um, and an alternative to sort of the utter alienation of the sort of industrial cities, industrial age cities. So that's the beginning of the whole idea we take for granted that, you know, the Sierra Nevada are, are this like um, spiritual, spiritually sustaining, essential, wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, and then from Wordsworth, it goes to Thoreau, and from Thoreau to John Muir and the, and speaking of the Sierras in California, John Muir and the Sierras and the Sierra clubs starts. And then that's the beginning of, you know, the, the modern environmental movement. Well, so it's kind of beautiful that, that, you know, today's environmental mu movement and our whole sense that we want to protect wilderness and the environment more generally began as the back Three, two, three, four, two, three hundred years ago, with Native American essentially philosophy that the Paleolithic. So that's exactly the same thing that drove ancient China, invented Taoism and Chan. Yeah, and that's yeah. Sort of the parallel I'm I'm leading and say, I'm running and saying. So now this is this is the time for Chan in America because the Chan is like the last step in that cultural transformation in not in America, but in, in the West, in Europe. Yeah, yeah. But in your book, uh, you sort of bring up, I wasn't quite clear about, you know, there's this stream, just like this parallel in, in ancient China after the Shang Dynasty, where, uh, you know, the Paleolithic uh, uh, stream continued on and was able to flourish. And in many ways, I think you suggest uh, save Chinese culture. Uh, and hopefully in that same way, there's this stream, you know, that's going through Western culture and now coming up and beginning to flower. Um, maybe that can too save uh, Western culture. But you also mentioned that even parts of that stream um, sort of still are separate from nature. In other words, um, still see nature as something to uh, take care of, to to use for our own purposes, to, uh, mm -hmm. to shepherd in a sense. And as long as you look at it in that way, 
you know, I'm going to take care of nature and it's going to be just right. You know, for me, mm -hmm. in a way, there's still that separation between yeah. the person and nature. It's that's still a kind sort of, of an argument that you make. Can you mm -hmm. that's the, that's, that? Yeah, that's the stewardship model of environmentalism. And on the one hand, it's practical. That's the Sierra Club stewardship model. On the one hand, it's practical because uh, it's the de facto, you know, reality now that we do control large swaths of the planet. Uh, and either we do good things uh, with or bad things. But at the same time, it, it like you said, it, it retains that kind of instrumental and exploitative detachment that the West has uh, built into sort of built into its cosmology, really, because we are seen as spirits that um, came here from our true spirit home, which is heaven. And, you know, we're playing out our, um, what's the word, the sort of divine plan or whatever, um, and using nature to work that plan out. And then if we're good, we go to back to our spirit heaven or not, or we don't. And so we're here almost as aliens. And that's where that sort of exploitative um, distance comes from or instrumental distance. And yeah, the stewardship thing is still the same, the same game. Uh, it's just a little more enlightened. And so I suspect that because the, the underlying framework is the same, uh, it, might not, it might not be enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I like, I like, I like going another level down and seeing, well, what happens if we're completely integrated, uh, which is what Chan, sort of the, what Chan wants. Yeah, yeah. You, um, you say, uh, you, you quote Mencius, the 10,000 things are all there in me, and there is no greater joy than looking within and finding myself faithful to them. Mm -hmm. I love that line. Um, can we do a third reading if you sure. if you have time? Yeah. This is on um, on page one thirteen. Okay. And unborn, which is that's a I don't want to say concept. <laughs> you know, that's a state. That's an expression that you certainly used in Hunger Mountain, and mm -hmm. and the characters moo or no, right? Yeah. And then show in Japanese show to be born, right? So right. not born. And it's got, in the Chinese, I find it's got a little more of a, it's got a little more heft or it's got a little, little more tooth to it, you know, but can yeah. you read this passage? And uh, yeah, I mean, just to say a little bit about unborn, I, I, unless you want to say more about it. No, no, I, oh. uh, I hear you. Um, Because in Taoism, you, you know, we think uh, the easy way to think is to think, well, we're we're born out of um, sort of the tissue of the cosmos, and we live our lives, and then we die back into it. And that's one level of describing um, life. Um, but a little deeper, we're never separate from that tissue. So we're and that's where, and that's where unborn comes from. We're never born out of that tissue. It's a little, it's a little bit, it's a little a, a more Taoist version of always al already enlightened. Um, we can't be separate from that tissue. So that's un, that's um, that's that's unborn. So here, this is a little paragraph that kind of after some discussion of that unborn idea of the, the unborn. We are unborn through and through, wild mind wholly integral to the generative existence tissue of wild earth, and accepting this engenders a new understanding of our unfolding eco-catastrophe. We can now see the sixth extinction as a completely natural event, human depredation no different from past causes of mass extinction, volcanoes, asteroids, glaciers, methane eruptions, gamma ray bursts. Because they occurred so long ago and did not directly impact us or the world we know, 
we can see those past extinction events as the cosmos sees them with that same indifference. We accept the mass of species lost as simply, we accept the mass of species loss as simply part of the planet's inevitable and natural evolution. And from the unborn perspective, we can see today's mass extinction event in the same way. You're, you're developing an idea there that um, I think is really essential to your to your discussion, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, that this mass extinction in in many ways is uh, you really can't call it bad you can't call it good it's a mass extinction right mm -hmm. um and in fact a little bit later you actually say that the sixth extinction is fine which i think in our language would be it's not it, it's hard to say because it's so emotionally charged right yeah it's very hard to say it's okay or it's fine because immediately people are going to grab onto something right mm -hmm. but can you talk about that that quality which i think i think you really communicated beautifully no oh, thank you uh yeah that's pretty hard because that's the whole second half of the book is to try to dig into that i guess pretty provocative idea but, you know, I think once, like I said in that paragraph, once we're, once you're unborn, you can see that, um, well, like we were saying earlier, you are the cosmos seeing itself, thinking itself, feeling itself. Well, the, you know, the cosmos, if, if the cosmos is what we are at the, at the deepest level, and I think we, we see that in meditation practice, um, and Chan and Chan practice more broadly, um, at least for as as it operates in ancient China. Um, then it's the then our our deepest self is is this un, constant unfolding, the great transformation. So wherever that great transformation goes is where it goes, and that's that's the that's its unfolding. And if it's going to go through a sixth extinction, that's what it, that's that's where it's going. And once you once you're unborn, once you belong completely to it, then it's like when the asteroid hit in Mexico. It's um, it's it's a hard argument to develop. And then I try to like cut back against it because I don't want to go all the way that way. Um, but it is, you know, I think it's easy to write, and there, are, you know. 40 million environmental books just say talking about we're going to solve this and being uh all cheery about it um but i don't think i don't think many of us really believe that i mean i think, I think most of us think this is pretty serious and we're not it's not it's not going to go well it's already not going well um so i wanted to like dig into that and see okay well if you see Chan deep, deeply enough, or just see the nature of consciousness and cosmos deeply enough, you see, you see, yeah, it's fine. And it's only when we see that it's fine that really we've gotten to the point that, we, yeah, we can actually start valuing it and doing something about it. Because then we're, then we've gotten past that kind of instrumental exploitative distance that the stewardship model has. You know, as long as the culture has that model, you know, Sierra Club will say preserve the mountain and the coal company will say dig the mountain up and there will be a debate and sometimes one will win and sometimes the other will win. And it's pretty clear that um, the other side has won most of those and they're going to keep winning most of those because that's where the money is. That's where the power is. Um, so it's not really realistic. But the only thing I think that's really going to change that is when cultural assumptions change. And that's what I talk about all through the book. And I sort of pick up um, Aldo Leopold, who wrote the uh, 
is the other kind of contemporary or more or less contemporary spirit in this book with Lynn White. Although Leopold who wrote the first time really in the West um, in a philosophical sense that um, the proposition that as he called it the land ethic, that it's the land, the, the natural community is where value lies, not just the human. And that's Robinson Jeffers was doing that at the beginning of the last century. Um, and he was pretty broadly reviled for the idea that it's this magisterial living cosmos that is where value lies, not in you know, our little human world. Um, and then that is the Sierra Club, um, it's out of um, Leopold, that, that land ethic uh, le leads to the Sierra Club. But Leopold also says, the only thing that's really gonna change this is changing the basic assumptions. And he says, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to talk about it. And that's our culture has completely failed at that. We have no religion or philosophy to account for that. And he leaves it at that. So in a sense, I'm like walking into that, that open space. I also say in the 60s, let people like Snyder walked into that and tried, tried yeah. to really developing that, that kind of um, line. Well, he, well, Lynn White left it to the beat Dixie, right? So yeah. thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll solve the six, the six <laughs> extinction just fine. <laughs> um, you know, you really love Robertson Jeffers. Could you read a Robertson Jeffers? Uh, maybe you know in the book. I haven't marked a specific one. Um, could you read uh, one of his poems for us? Uh, let's see. Um, I wonder... I can read a couple little fragments from poems that are sort of about this that I was talking about. So here's one to, to sort of show you what, you know, what he was saying. This is a yeah. hundred years ago. Integrity is wholeness. The greatest beauty is organic wholeness, the wholeness of life and things, the divine beauty of the universe. Love that, not man apart from that. So man, you know, he's still in the sexist language, but, uh, and here's another one. And this is almost a description of, you know, of Chan practice. We must uncenter our minds from ourselves. We must unhumanize our views a little and become confident as the rock and ocean that we were made from. So that's a little, a little taste of what he, of what he's like yeah and you had a wordsworth poem that you thought was pretty relevant yeah although you want to hear that it's a little longer um yeah, a little let's see if i can find it oh let's see we had set 18 or no, oh, that was Scotland. Thirty eight. Thirty eight. Thank you, Joan. Oh, yeah. Well, this is these are I, I was using these a, a poem, a couple of poems like this one Coleridge, one Wordsworth, and then a little later one that's um, by Shelley to sort of show you that um, the invention here, I mean, one stage in that transformation from like a, a sky god, otherworldly monotheism, and this happened fascinatingly in China and in America, is a stage of pantheism where, where the culture is trying to get past this sky, you know, otherworldly sky god, trying to invest the sacred in the earth, in the, you know, the everyday world around us. So that's pantheism and the way, so, you know, when all sort of, I don't know what the words are, sacred value was in God, this other world of God, if you want to take a step and start investing um, the earth landscape wildness with uh, kind of, kind of supreme value, the first, the first idea culture has ancient China and Europe is, well, let's make it sacred. Let's make it God. So pantheism is, um, you know, the world, God is the world around us. So, um, and so here's a, 
this is um, Wordsworth sort of describing it that way. And then, and then the world becomes magic, right? It's in few, it's becomes numinous. And then the West, you know, since that is, we, I think we pretty much left the pantheism thing behind and the world is pretty much um, sufficient and magical enough in and of itself. And that's essentially Taoist, the equivalent of Taoism and Chan in ancient China. Um, so this is a this is a Wordsworth, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air, and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth and of all the mighty world. I, so long a worshiper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service. So that's, you know, that, that poem is 1798, I think. Yeah, 1798. And that is really the beginning of this sense that we all take for granted, you know, why the Sierra Club exists, why the environmental movement exists, why we, you know, take trips into the mountains or go to the seashore or anything. Before this, people didn't do that. They thought the mountains were uh, this devil, you know, the devil's playground or something like that. And, the, and, they, and they thought that wildness was something that had to be tamed and brought into God's order. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you to read one more poem on, on page <laughs> yeah. 89? I love hearing you read poems, but uh, this is... Uh, first 89? Moon. Yeah, page 89, First Moon Dufu. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. That was the Wordsworth you wanted me to read. You still want me to read the Wordsworth? <laughs> the one oh, we got we got a piece of the words we can. Yeah. So this is um, uh, Dufu uh, in the eighth century, um, and I you know I guess you can notice here. Uh, I, I I put this poem in because I was contrasting it to another Wordsworth poem, and just so you can see even a nature poem in the West looks very different. It still has that that instrumental separation that the, a poem in China doesn't. So here you can just see this. So this, instead of investing nature with this kind of um, divinity, this is what, this is what a, a, um, a Chinese, you know, quote unquote nature poem sounds like. First moon, thin slice of ascending light, radiant arc tipped to side belly dark. The first moon appears and barely risen beyond ancient frontier passes, edges into clouds. Silver, changeless, the star river spreads across mountains empty in their own cold. Lucent frost dusts the courtyard, chrysanthemum blossoms clotted there in swollen dark. So the star river is the Milky Way. But yeah, there he's he's like invested, you know, everything is sufficient um, in and of itself, doesn't need divinity, um, doesn't need, you know, this philosophical framework telling you why it's important. It's just already there. Where was that uh, in his life? He had uh, he had a very tough life sent off to the wars and, and the like. And Oh, I think that's when, yeah, he, 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 in middle age, he, uh, there was a, just a colossal civil war broke out in China that killed or displaced like two thirds of the population. I mean, we can't even imagine that kind of destruction. And he was all from, from then on, he was one step ahead of that. And this, I think was very soon after he, um, he fled and he was um, on, on the sort of on the western fringes of Chinese uh, of China, and he spent the rest of his life kind of moving along the fringes in the west, and then in the south, and finally died in the south. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I want to open it up to uh, John Tarrant and Allison Atwell if uh, if you have uh, anything to to say or to ask. Would love to love to hear. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I I was kind. Of, it was really great hearing you read the Wordsworth alongside the Chinese classics. You know, mm -hmm. who was who's the person who did the one about the the white crane and the or the white egret and the um, pear blossoms that you began with? But who's that's there? Dumu, Dumu, which is uh, the same the same family. I mean, it's the same Du, but. Is Du Fu is the first moon and Du Mu is the egret. Yeah, and he was about 100 years after Du Fu. It's a beautiful poem. poem. And there's an immediate, you know, you mentioned this, but the immediacy is so striking. And the Wordsworth, there's a kind of feeling and textural quality to Wordsworth's, um, you know, poem, but he's still talking about his thoughts in some way. Yeah, him. right, exactly. And, uh, and you mentioned that you mentioned that too, and I like Wordsworth, but that's why I don't read him that much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I care about him. I think he did this beautiful thing, as, as you've said. And uh, but and that I think into Cha, my understanding, like from inside the practice world of Cha, is to that immediacy of the you know the, the green eye or the, the beak and the white. The white feathers of the egret and the, mm -hmm. and the pear blossoms, and that there's a certain way that life does start to hit you in the face all the time, and uh, or like it's it's overwhelming. There's an overwhelming participation that happens all the time, really. Yeah, one isn't that much thinking about it. It's not that it's not that thought is disapproved of. It's that that one is immersed in in all this, and mm -hmm. and, and you need to see past it, right? You know, that, that's just like the charm thing, I think, you know, really. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the, the, so uh, that's kind of great. And I am kind of really struck with the idea that it never made sense to me that, you know, uh, Bodhidharma is suddenly this Taoist sage having come from the Indian philosophical tradition. Yeah. I don't know how to sort that out, but <laughs> you have a, a reasonably plausible thing is that he was already absorbed in, in, um, in Taoism in some way. Yeah, yeah. We often forget about the language problem too. You know, you don't you don't just even today you don't get on a plane and fly to southern China and walk onto the streets and you suddenly have a bit, this big philosophical discussion with the emperor. Which is the story of Bodhidharma. He arrives in he arrives in southern China and has this this debate philosophical debate with the emperor. Also, Chinese just doesn't it, there's something disturbing about the language that's, you know, not being a, an alphabet language, you know, and mm -hmm. so, on. so so the way it's formed, it does something different. I think it does something different in my mind, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't, and uh, so and I think that comes through the somehow the I imagine that the Chan and the Taoism and the, and the language sort of they interacted in some way because there's so much. Just like a Chinese painting that's got so much space in it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Any, any thoughts about that, or George? Oh yeah, I've written a lot about that. That's that, I think that's pretty uh, remarkable because Chinese grammar. We talked about looking at something, but you know, John, I realize we can't because we can't show anybody those lines of Chinese. Right. Anyway, Chinese grammar is really wide open. Most a lot of the stuff in English isn't there, so that kind of emptiness of meditation is almost there in a classical poem. Like the subjects are often not there. You even usually, sometimes the verbs, certainly all the all the little words that fill up our language and, and sort of explain everything, like you have element A and B, and how are they connected? Well, the English will say it's A and B, or A therefore B, or A but B or A and then B, or, you know, all the all the different ways we can relate them. Well, China, that space where the relation's gonna happen is just empty. So we we kind of like fill it in. Yeah, it's kind of um, disturbing. It's both wonderful and terrifying in a way. Yeah. It's always falling into the, the empty. Well, it's, it's fun for me because it leaves it wide open. So I get to really reinvent the poems. I can't just, it's not just 
you know, reorganizing grammar and change and changing, uh, you know, the 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 word from, you know, like the word for tree in another language into tree in English. It's it's a lot more. So here's uh, we were John and I were talking about this before. So I'll just read the. Um, well, let me read. Okay, hang on a second. I'll read a. I read a very short poem, another one that is in this book, and this one's very meditative and imagistic. Autumn begins, autumn begins unnoticed. Night slowly lengthen, and little by little, clear winds turn colder and colder, summer's blaze giving way. My thatch hut grows still. At the bottom stair, in bunch grass, lit dew shimmers. So that's very much just a meditation poem. It starts out that he starts out with he's so preoccupied he doesn't notice autumn and slowly his mind settles and then all it's just mirror mind that's made up entirely of that spark of light in the uh, in the in the grass. Well, the last line there in Chinese is literally stairs below clump grass sea dew radiance. And the you can hear the emptiness in that, um, and the magical thing is the the line C, or the word C, because there's no subject for that, right? Yeah. It's just C. So there's a, that's the empty. It's an empty. There's an empty space there in the middle of the line, and there's you kind of know it's the poet because that's a convention. Uh, lyric poems like this are always about the poet's immediate experience, but he's not there. So there's so you know Chan, kind of Chan empty mind mirror mind is just there in the language, um, structuring structuring consciousness. The, um, in the koans, that's um, for why you know uh, until people come to like it, that's sort of disturbing because people want a proper subject object. Verb yeah. Object mm -hmm. in, in the koans, and the koans that, like uh, I'm thinking of the the kalp of fire famous Kalpa fire con when the universe is destroyed at the end of this Kalpa and then destroyed or not like what's what's destroyed or not me the you everything anything left that sort of thing and uh -huh. it's just all dangling and so you've got to in a certain way inhabit that yourself like you are you different from the universe is the yeah right your consciousness is your consciousness you're hoping will survive or is it you know uh -huh. so uh and that's all through, like, when you look at the koan, like the blue cliff and stuff, it's just full of that rather wonderful way in which it doesn't hold your hand. And you've really got to, in a certain sense, open. Yeah. Do you read Chinese? Sort of awakening to just meet it, you know. So. Yeah. Do you read Chinese? No, but I've been working with a friend. Yeah, uh -huh. like, yeah I mean, I got through a dictionary. yeah, on the one hand, there's all that ambiguity. And at the same time, in the blue cliff record, over and over and over and over, it's all about uh, dismantling whatever has, seems to be certain. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like yeah. very often, the the person who seems to be the teacher, the you know, the the master in the koan, usually it's a master and a student, and the student says something dumb, and the master is enlightened. Well, very often, uh, if you're reading closely and if you're reading the Chinese. Uh, you realize no, this the student just outsmarted this guy, the, the master. That is, or there's the koan with with a certain whatever you know insight is there in whatever way the insight is there, and then there's the the commentary poem, which inevitably attacks the insight and the person who had the in the in the usually a a historic Chan master. Again, dismantling, always wanting to dismantle. Well, any certainty, any any um, any claim to to knowing. Well, that, there is that thing in you know a lot of the Chan record you know, where um, when we're not doing the usual things the mind is doing, um, it's not that they're bad or anything, but then something else happens where, like, it's the the white feathers of the bird and the pear blossoms blowing and and you just filled with that and you become yeah rain, right rain yeah. Spew. it doesn't it's not out there that sort of thing and so that probably I, I mean i think that's where the 
I imagine that's where the whole, whole notion of Paleolithic connection comes from. But you know, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And that poem is is interesting, and maybe I'll read it again. And listen, yeah. what happens? Um, great poem. <laughs> what? It's a great poem. It is good choice to sort of to be the axis for the book. <laughs> yeah, it comes back. I don't know. It comes back over and over and over. Um, but sort of notice what happens when the last line happens. It isn't just it isn't just these images. There's something else happens. Egrets, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade. They fish in shadowy streams. Then startling away into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a tree full, tumble in the evening wind. So you, the poem has you completely enwrapped with the, the mountains and the egrets. And then that ends. And then there's kind of like this silence and then something complete. And, th and that's like, that's like this jump that you, that you were saying, this jump of emptiness. And then there's this total jump because pear blossoms have nothing to do with what's going on in this poem. And suddenly you've jumped to pear blossoms falling. And then you, and then you. The marvelous thing there is that um, in that space between the two images, and it gives you this one image of the, the snowy white egrets flying away, and then immediately gives you the image of the white blossoms falling, and one becomes the other in mm -hmm. experience and in your mind. There's this marvelous um, uh, melding of the disparate image and experience into one yeah yeah because one is like a fluttering white going up and one's a fluttering white going down right exactly yeah, yeah. um a couple things uh, one of the, one thing i wanted to say is that you're the thing about you were talking about the blue cliff and how the teachers were constantly trying to undermine and dismantle certainty and it made me think of your description of the unborn. And, and in a way, the unborn would be the experience of the unborn is the experience of uncertainty of the unborn appearing in the moment you're in is the is is the feeling of uncertainty. The other thing I want to I was very struck by is that you when JJ was asking you, you know, what your affiliations were and mm -hmm. what your are you working with any or have you working with any teachers or any any Zen um, communities? And you said, you know, you you had a direct um you were working with the master's mind, the the Chan masters themselves. And and so I was thinking about your description of Hunger Mountain and how it was very much the quality of a practice of some kind of meditative um, practice that you placed yourself in or you fell into or the mountain itself called you into this practice where you would walk up and down and meet the mountain and meet your own mind every time that you would walk it and um, how the experience of Chan is was actually infused in all of those elements the mountain mm -hmm. the mind and in the practice and in in the language that you were carrying with you i just would love to hear you speak about that a little bit oh um well to jump back a little bit i i don't i'm not when i say that about um inhabiting those ancient minds it's not it's not any kind of claim of you know direct transmission from the ancients it's just uh just kind of an empirical fact that's where i that's where i was that's where i am um yeah the mountain i mean yeah it's not, it's kind of boring you just I'm, how boring can you be just walk up the same mountain just take the same walk over and over and over i think i've walked up that mountain at least 300 times in my life. I've been walking up it for over 30 years. Um, Got to be an average of once a month, probably probably more. Uh, and um, and somehow, in, you know, because it's because everything is known, it's kind of opens your mind. Because if you're trying to orient, 
I feel orienting all the time. I don't know about you. Just the, just this impulse, like a pay, almost Paleolithic impulse to orient, you know, to know where, where am I? Uh, you know, in the Paleolithic, it was so where is fire? Where is home? Where is food? Where is, but I still feel that. So if I'm worried about orient, if I go somewhere new and set out, then I'm like, too much of me is is worried about, am I gonna get back in time? Um, where's that turn, you know, where where am I going? So going up the mountain over and over, just the same one is just um, kind of mind opening because less and less you have to worry about where you're going. You don't have to think about that. And um, I don't really know how the idea of, um, you know, I'm uh, again, I'm not that smart. I, I think when I first started Hunger Mountain, somehow, I, you know, I wanted to write, I had done all these translations and I wanted to write something because ancient, all of ancient Chinese, all of Chan is about immediate experience. It's all immediacy. So as long as you're just writing about it in the abstract, you're still, you're always there. That's where you always are. So I wanted to try to make a book that somehow combined the ideas with the media scene. And then of course, mountains are the thing in China. You know, they don't, they don't make paintings and poems about the oceans, which is kind of interesting. Almost no paintings or poems about the ocean. It's all mountains. You know, the ocean is the other gigantic wild presence on the planet. Um, so then I, so I thought, okay, well, what about making it a walk up Hunger Mountain since I do that all the time. And first I tried just this one long thing, one long walk and then Somehow it morphed into a whole bunch of little walks so I could have, because the writing's pretty intense. People often say, oh, I can read one essay, that's all at a time, then I have to stop. So doing it as one big book was just too intense. So I, I broke it up into whatever, 20 chapters or something, 20 chapters, 20 walks. Is that an answer? Or? Can I can I comment, Alison? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I thought that was great because uh, the thing about Hunger Mountain was that it was in Vermont. <laughs> it was really an ordinary mountain such as we all stroll up it, you know, yeah. you can strolls up their local little mountain. And uh, and uh, actually we got, I, we got copies and gave it to all our leadership uh, as a New Year's gift because it was bringing Chan home. In, oh, in perfect. So oh, good. And I, I very much could tell you'd probably taken that swerve before but you it's completely correct and true for it to be in china but also it has to be here here too and and, uh, and I oh like yeah you know that's interesting because i did tease for a while with the idea of making it a mountain in china uh -huh. um but but just like you say no it's got to be it, it doesn't work that way it would be more of an adventure story and maybe it'd sell more books but that's not what i wanted to you know it's got to be this not terribly dramatic mountain that's you know right right here but yeah i think that's great <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so anyway i wanted to say that and i can tell you're doing something in your own pra practice as an artist or practice as a writer with that book it felt to me that you there was some departure there that, mm -hmm. that perhaps, perhaps i don't understand your work well enough to know you'd always no, no, no. well that was the first book of pr sort of prose essays before then the the ideas had all been in introductions and um, and embedded in the translations. And they always did wonderful translations. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, Alison, I interrupted you. <laughs> Alison was on riding a horse somewhere, and I. I, just, I <laughs> that was great. It was great fun. One thing when you were saying about um, meeting the masters' minds and not wanting to to feel that you know you had some special line to the masters or something it was very charming but what came to me was that when you, when i go into an art museum i'm actually it's the same thing i'm meeting the mind of michelangelo when i'm standing next to the david and it's a direct encounter in the same way that it is with the poetry i, I think yeah i think that's that's always always true for me i would when i when i was you know college age and uh, wandering culture, you know, I spent a lot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of time in museums, and that's what I was doing. Like you, you go look at um, 
I remember Ed Reinhardt paintings and it's like, you're all the way at the bottom of empty mind meditation in, in, one, in a Reinhardt painting. Um, and it wasn't, and it was somewhat in, intended him, but that's true, yeah, for all paintings. And I've been, I've been talking to people lately, I don't know why it's come up a few times. In ancient China, a lot of, if you look, go to a Chinese museum, a lot of paintings, a lot of great, great paintings will say in the spirit of or after or um, attributed. They might attribute to a master, but they're not sure. But in ancient China for sort of art practice, if you, if you it was very, everybody copied the master. So you would copy out a master's painting or a master's calligraphy. And it was exactly that. It was you inhabit that person's mind. It was it was Chan practice. And so if the original was lost, which is so often the case, very often there are these copies by especially good artists. And in the West, we would say, oh, that's just a copy. That's nothing. Um, because that uh, this idea that you, you know, you intuitively get doesn't exist in the West. You know, there's this authenticity of the original. But for the Chinese, it's the it's the vision, which is embedded in landscape, which is, you know, mirror, in a, you know, sort of Chan mirroring is my is mind. So the painting itself is the painter's mind. And if you can copy that, you've got the painter's mind. And that's what matters, not, you know, was it? And and also that's interesting because I of the sense of it isn't a matter of of kind of Western individual identity like the, the the original painter and the second painter. It's because it's this empty mind is what what these paintings are about and there's no identity there. So then the idea that the that the copy is just as valuable as the original makes a lot more sense. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it does. Well, it, and what came to mind is when I was in art school, we had to copy um, the masters. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by how much was conveyed in how, it, in order to make an exact copy, I would actually have to move my brush or my hand in a way that I would not naturally have yeah. done. And it, it was... Yeah, you definitely could feel the mind of, of the artist. Yeah. It's interesting that, you know, maybe in the West, yeah, people, that's part of edu art education, but people might not conceive of it at the depth that, the, that they do in the West, even though they sense it, I think, like you're saying you did. You, you really sense that, oh, I'm kind of, in a way, becoming this artist. Yes. Um, but in China, they have this whole framework within which to understand it, which I kind of love. David, I, I, um, yeah. this is a bit of a diversion, but we're getting short of time. The, um, there are great river poems in China, like Li Bai is for, there's lots of great po poems about the great river and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think, and there are all these mar mar ports and ancient history of seafaring, going to Africa, all that. What, what do you, why do you think people didn't engage with the ocean the way <laughs> I don't know it's kind of a million dollar question really yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> well I think maybe because the ocean isn't um dynamic enough you know mountains so I think in hunger man I say in in mountains you can see like the energy of the earth going up and sort of uh seething up into the energy of sky so there's like heaven and earth uh, in Chinese. Um, so there's all that energy of, um, and there's the energy of weather, because mountain weather is wild. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's the yin yang thing in China. Yang is the male active energy. Um, yin is the female, so more passive energy, dark energy. And rivers and mountains, was is the Chinese word for landscape and rivers and mountains. The rivers are the yin and mountains are yang. Earth is yin, heaven is yang. So mountains let the, that dynamic um, interaction of yin and yang. You can see it's where you see it in landscape. So I think that's why it is. But maybe it's very, very uh, easily understood. Still, it's, you know, 
they were never, I, mean, I don't know if I know a single ocean poem. You know, you would think this massive thing, and China's got a gigantic seacoast, you'd think they would have engaged with it somehow, but maybe they're so, they operate so much within this conceptual framework um, that... The great poets tended to get exiled to mountains whenever they fell out of faith. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They did, but well, some of them must have. There were cities on the coast, they on the southern coast, they must have gotten exiled. Like actually, Cialino, on the person I said wrote that seminal, the, the first Chan essay, he was exiled. His sort of enlightenment moment was he got exiled to the mountainous sea coast, but he was on the coast. He didn't write about the ocean, though. He wrote about mountains, and that's where he kind of that's where Chan happened for him, yeah. yeah. Mm. We have a couple of comments. When um, um, cloud story of Kai, let me see. I'm reminded of the blue uh, Peter Blue cloud story of Coyote undermining the certainty of who killed Coyote, ultimately claiming the kill for himself. And David, uh, thank you. Uh, you illuminate China root and brought it down to earth, as indeed you did. Thank you, <laughs> John or Allison. Anything, anything um, to finish here? No, it's great. Uh, I mean, I can tell how you have saturated yourself in the in the great work, you know. And um, in a certain sense, you've become one. You know, one becomes one of those in, in some way, in some very so odd American sort of way. You yeah. Know? yeah, it's a great thing, and I think that's what we're trying. We're trying to inhabit the ancient culture to bring it out so it comes through our hands and our minds. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. I think it needs to be living in now and not yeah, some yeah. Rom romance of uh, 8th century China. Get it out of the tongue uh, and the song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> when, when Wang Wei, the great landscape poet, was hanging out with the sixth patriarch and on and on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, and thank you so much, David, for generously, so generously giving uh, Civic Zen another evening of yours. I know it's late for you, and it's just very, really kind of you to, to give this to us. Really appreciate well, it's, it. It's, it's completely my honor and privilege. Um, I'm grateful that all of you want to spend your evening. So, uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, David. You're right. Uh, but our most mm -hmm. elemental teacher may now be the great vanishing itself. And we've got a elemental teacher in Vermont too as well. So thank you very much for all your hard work. And we look forward to, to uh, new things uh, coming out as you mentioned. And we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you all for coming. Good night.